Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By faith, Abraham obeyed. For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who, through faith, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice. We pray for faith in the fight. How's everybody doing? Doing good? Hey, can we appreciate all those involved in our special needs ministry, the kids, the volunteers, Aaron Thiessen. So thankful for so many of you that serve in so many different ways, people like Aaron that see a need, start a ministry, and that is ministering to so many people, including my wife and uh, myself. Our oldest has special needs, Jake, 12 years old, and we have experienced the blessing of Jake being loved every single week with a sidekick that walks around with him, that loves him. So just so thankful for our church and all the different ministries that we have that meet the needs of so many different people. Hey, I want to encourage you to grab your Bible out. Uh, Mark chapter 2 is where you're going to find me. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. One of the ushers will get one to you. Turn to the New Testament. Look for the guy's names. Matthew, Mark. If you get to Luke or John, you've gone too far. Go back to the left. Feel free to use your, lo- tr- uh, your electronic device. Uh, anything that you have to track with us. Also, inside your bulletins are sermon notes. A uh, great way to track with the message today. I do want to welcome those joining us online. So glad that you're tuning in with us today. We're in an eight week series, week two of a series titled Faith in the Fight, looking at men and women from the Old Testament, the New Testament, that refused to give up, but they believed in God, they believed in Jesus, they believed that their answer, the solution to their life, their situation, other people's situation was Jesus. And so we're looking at that today, fighting against complacency, fighting against giving up, fighting against going through the motions, fighting against uh, just being stagnant, but truly trusting Jesus in areas of our life where we are powerless. And we're going to see that in this story. Mark chapter 2, would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Mark chapter 2, this is how the scriptures read, it says, And when he, speaking of Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now there were some scribes that were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose. And immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all. So they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, would you, would you open our hearts? God, we pray that you would give us faith. Would you give us a faith in you that impacts the people around us? God, would you have your way in our lives today? It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. You may be seated. Your faith will impact others. If there's one message that we get today from this text, from this story, we need to understand that our faith will impact others. And before we dive into chapter 2, I want us to understand the context of what was going on in chapter 1. Chapter 1, John the Baptist is there. He prepares the way for Jesus. He, he says there's somebody that's coming that's greater than I, somebody whose sandals I am not even worthy to wear. Now, John uh, the Baptist, he was an interesting bird. All right, he ate uh, locusts and wild honey. His, his clothing was camel hair and a leather belt. So if you wanted to take a friend and go see the newest Star Wars movie, you would take John the Baptist. Why? Because he looks a little bit like Chewbacca, right? Just a little bit. And if you asked, hey, do you want some uh, popcorn? He'd say, no, but would you please pass the grasshoppers, right? He's just a little bit weird. But he knew his role to prepare the way for Jesus. He baptizes Jesus. Jesus comes up out of the water. And what happens shortly later? Jesus is tempted. I'm amazed how the enemy works at our hearts. Often for so many of us, we will give our lives to Jesus Christ. We will get baptized, and then immediately Satan will attack us, and he will tempt us. He will want to distract us. He will want to discourage us. He will want to destroy us. That's how Satan works. And I notice in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus' way to, to uh, attack temptation, to defend himself from temptation, to not give in to temptation, was going right back to the Word of God, going right back to truth. It's the same solution for every single one of us, is when we are tempted, we go right back to the Word of God. And after Jesus is tempted, uh, of course, he does not give in to sin. Jesus is fully God. He goes on and he begins his ministry. And what does Jesus start doing? He starts healing people. He starts healing people that are demon-possessed. He starts healing people that are sick. He starts healing people that have leprosy. And people from all over the place are flocking to see Jesus, flocking to have their family members healed, flocking to be healed themselves. People are sending out uh, updates on Instagram, Facebook. They know where he's at. And yet Jesus would often go to lonely places places to pray because of all the miracles. At the end of Mark chapter 1, Jesus heals somebody with leprosy, and he says, don't tell anybody about this miracle. Now, why would Jesus do that? Jesus didn't want the people to be so into the miracles that they missed out on the ministry and the message of Jesus Christ, the message that Jesus Christ came to forgive sins and give us access to a holy God. He, he didn't want people to, to miss out on his message and his ministry. And then we go to chapter 2 and what's taking place. Jesus is hanging out. Jesus is hanging out most likely at Peter's house. And people find out where he's at. And they just, they just start coming. They just enter the house. Could you imagine just hanging out at home and people just walking right in? Talk about hospitality, right? People just start coming into your house. So it's so full, people are literally standing outside the door. And what does Jesus do? They're, they're looking for a miracle. They're hungry for a miracle. He's teaching the word of God. Why? Because our greatest need is so much deeper than miracles. Our hearts need to be changed. Now, we don't know what Jesus was teaching. We do know his message from Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. What was his message? He came proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That, that was the message of Jesus. And we see that Jesus was, was teaching the word. Now outside the house, something else was happening. Outside the house, there were four guys that, that had this friend that was paralyzed. Now, this paralyzed friend had two challenges. He needed to get to Jesus, but he couldn't get there on his own. Because he was paralyzed, he couldn't walk. The second challenge was that the house was full. It was so full that people were blocking the door. So he had these two obstacles that needed to be uh, overcome. And yet he's got these friends that are probably carrying him from who knows how far, probably getting tired, so tired, they're like, man, we got to let him down, let's switch sides, carry it around, and the guys in the back are maybe banging their shins on the bed or whatever, and that's what happens when you're carrying in the back and not the front, right? And they're carrying him, and they, they realize when they get to the house where Jesus is at, there's a problem. There's no room. The door's blocked. 
Now, it would have been so easy for these guys to just put the guy down and say, you know what, we'll, we'll come back tomorrow. It would have been so easy to say, you know what, it just must, must not be the time. It would have been so easy for the guys to give up. But what do they do? They probably huddled like a football team, four players. They're coming up with a plan. They're like, you know what, there's, there's a staircase in the back or there's a ladder in the back, which most ha houses had. And they're like, you know what, if we can just get them up on the roof, we'll, we'll start digging a hole in the roof and we'll lower them down right in the presence of Jesus. So that's exactly what they did. Now, we don't know the struggle we don't know how difficult it was. We don't know how much they were sweating, uh, the challenge of getting somebody that was paralyzed up on a roof and then actually digging a, a hole in the roof. Now it was wooden beams, uh, lots of branches, clay, so it wasn't difficult to dig a hole. But I wonder what was happening on the inside of the house when Jesus is teaching and talking. I mean, people had to hear this. This, this wasn't quiet. They're not thinking it was Santa Claus unless he ate a lot of cookies and drank a lot of milk, right? This was a loud noise. And they're hearing this. And I wonder if Jesus is just smiling at this time. I wonder if Jesus is just starting to cross his arms because he knows that these four friends are doing whatever is needed to bring their friends to Jesus. But, but they had to hear they, ha they had to know that something's going on upstairs on top of the roof. Several years ago, my dad was very scared at 6 o'clock in the morning because he heard something on our roof. He didn't know if it was a bobcat. He didn't know if it was a possum. So he went outside slowly and peeked up on the top of the roof, and there was Todd, the paper boy. <laughs> Todd had actually thrown the paper up on the roof. Now, we didn't have a ladder at our house. He actually climbed a pole, which would have been entertaining to watch, <laughs> got up on the roof to get the paper. He was willing to do what he needed to do, but, but these people had to hear that there were people up on the roof. And I want us to see uh, three things from this text that stand out that are, that are powerful from the eyes of Jesus. Number one in your notes is simply this. Jesus saw their faith. I, I love those words in verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the friends, why? Because our faith is always visible. Jesus sees what we do. He knows why we do it. Our faith always does something. It responds in obedience. And, and Jesus sees their faith. Now, it would have been so easy for these guys to just, just again stop and say, you know what, it's, it's not the right time. Uh, you know what, I'm waiting for the ideal circumstance, and you know, we'll just, we'll just do that later. How many of us have done that? How many of us are waiting for the perfect time to bring our friends to church, the perfect time to have a spiritual conversation, the perfect time to tell our friends about Jesus? Can I just say, you will be waiting for the perfect time for the rest of your life? Because there is no perfect time. What these guys knew was that Jesus was the answer to his problems. What these guys believed is that if they could just get their friend to Jesus, his life would be changed. And they were willing to do what, whatever was needed, whatever possible, to get their friends to Jesus. And so Jesus saw their faith. And they were fighting against being complacent. They were fighting against making excuses. They were fighting against ignoring the call of God. And they stepped out in faith. Now, now what did Jesus see in their faith? Four, four things that Jesus saw. Number one is the faith of the friends was active. The faith of the friends was, was active. Why? Because faith always does something. It is so easy for us as followers of Jesus Christ to talk about our faith, to read about faith, to discuss faith, but real faith, tangible faith, authentic faith always results in action. In fact, James puts it this way in James chapter 2. He says, what good is it, my brothers? If a man claims to have faith, but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. James is saying, faith always does something. Faith always results in action. And how often do we talk about faith, but we do nothing? 
And yet I think for so many of us, one of the greatest challenges we have is we focus on the obstacles. We focus on what could go wrong. I mean, think about these guys. They could think, well, what if we drop him? What if he falls off the steps? What if we fall through the roof? What if we annoy other people? For so many of us, we focus on the obstacles and how we feel, the discomfort that we feel, and what we see. Instead of living out of faith that's active because our faith will always impact others. The friends had a faith that was active. Notice next in your notes, the friends had a faith that was persistent. They had a, they had a faith that was persistent. This was a group of guys that refused to hear the words no. These was a group of guys that said, you know what, there has to be another way. This is a group of guys that because they wanted their friend to, to experience Jesus, they invented the first skylight in that house. They dug a, a huge hole and just dropped them into the presence of Jesus. And I wonder at that moment if Jesus, again, is just sitting there, smiling, crossing his arms, just thinking, wow, I love seeing your faith. That they had a faith that refused to give up. And we see this other times in Scripture. We see this in Mark chapter 5. A woman who for 12 years was bleeding, but she believed she knew the answer to her problem was Jesus. And if she could just reach out and touch Jesus, then she would be healed. Now, socially and uh, religiously, if she would have reached out and touched somebody else, she would have made them unclean as well because she was unclean. She didn't care. She just wanted to, to touch Jesus because she knew that Jesus was the answer to her problem. She reaches out. She goes through the crowd. She reaches Jesus. She touches on his cloak. Jesus literally feels the power of God go out of him, and she's healed. We see this in Mark chapter 10. Uh, Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is somebody that needed a healing. And uh, people were telling him, hey, shut up. Leave Jesus alone. He wouldn't stop. He's eventually healed from his blindness as well. But it's this persistent faith. It's this faith that's unwilling to give up. I had a friend in college who really liked this girl named Jennifer. He's like, man, I, I really like her. I want to ask her out. So he asked her out, and she said no. He asked her out a second and third time. She said no. A fourth, a fifth, a sixth time. She said no. Asked her out a seventh time. She finally said yes. They eventually got married. Why? Because he was persistent. Now, just to clarify, today, if you do that, they call you a stalker and you go to jail. <laughs> All right? A little crazy. So I'm not encouraging that. But what I am saying is here's a guy that refused to give up. I mean, think about it just for a moment. How many of us have given up on Jesus? That situation in our life where our only hope, the only answer is Jesus, we've stopped praying. But those people in our life where we've stopped praying for them. Because we, we're just thinking, you know, God, they're too far. They're, there's too much sin. They're too far gone from you. Like, who in your life have you stopped praying for that you need to begin praying for again today? And yet some of you are here today and you have a faith that's persistent because you're single and you want to be married and you every day are praying that God would bless you with a spouse that's godly and you will not compromise. For some of you, you've got wayward children or, or children that are just uh, going through difficulty and you every single day believe that if they can just meet Jesus, their life will be forever changed. That was the faith of these four guys. They knew that the answer to their friend was Jesus and they were going to find a way, they were going to do whatever it took to get them to Jesus. Their faith was active. Their faith was persistent. Thirdly, their faith was creative. Their faith was creative. They were willing to do something out of the ordinary to get their friend to Jesus. They were willing to say, you know what, Let, let's see what our options are. We can't go through the, through the front door. The window's blocked. And then there's probably that creative guy that says, hey, what if we climb a ladder or the stairs and drop them through the roof? Right, right? Those, I mean, those are the people that I like hanging out with. They think outside the box. They think creatively. Why? Because they knew, again, if we can get him to Jesus, his life will be changed. You think creatively. If you trust God with creative faith, you will forever impact people. 
Last year, I turned 40, and I had a birthday party. And I had some friends over that night. The next morning, had a knock on the front door. A friend of mine, I opened the door. Uh, he was there. He tossed me a pair of car keys. And I, I got the, the keys, and on there was Dodge. Now, my favorite car is a Dodge Challenger. So I went out front, and my heart sank into my left foot because there in the driveway was a 2015 Dodge Challenger. And he said, before you get too excited, it's just a rental. And I said, hey, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. But I found out that this wasn't a rental from Modesto because Modesto didn't have them. Stockton didn't have them. Merced didn't have them. He went all the way to San Jose, rented the car, and drove it back. And here's what happened. We, we, Kelly and I drove. We st stayed in San Francisco for a couple nights, so we got to drive the car around for a couple days. Every time there was a red light, I got ready for that, that light to turn green. <laughs> and I, I just got to confess right here, I stepped on the gas as hard as I could every single time. And then uh, we get to the red light, stop, I would do the same thing. My wife, and I loved it, her back was like glued to the back of the seat. It was like the coolest thing ever. She's like, Jer, because that's, that's how she talks to me when she's fresh. Jer, do you have to do this every time? <laughs> Guys, what's the answer to that? Yeah. Yes! Of course, A, it's a Dodge Challenger, B, it's a rental, right? <laughs> like if I didn't do that, my man card would get revoked. <laughs> I'll never forget that, that weekend. Why? Because it was somebody that thought outside the box. Somebody didn't say, oh, you know what, it, they don't have one in Modesto, it's not going to happen. Somebody that, th that was creative in the way they thought. See, if you're, you're creative in your faith, your faith will always impact others. They had a faith that was active, a faith that was persistent, a faith that was creative. Fourthly, it was a faith that was sacrificial. A faith that was sacrificial. What did they do? They tore apart a roof. They thought, you know what, we can do the repairs later. The most important thing is that we, we get this guy to Jesus. And they, maybe they knew Peter and they thought, you know what, Peter will get over it, Peter will be cool, got the skylight, like I said before. Uh, we're modernizing this house, but, but they, they had to sacrifice. They had to sacrifice the looks that they got of a, from other people. Like, what are you crazy guys doing carrying up somebody that's paralyzed on a roof? They had to be uncomfortable. One of the most ways that we step out of our comfort zones, one of the things that we can do is by doing things and going places that we've never been before. Can I just say that is one of the scariest things that we can do as followers of Jesus Christ is to go places because of our faith that we've never gone before and sacrifice how we feel, sacrifice our comfort. Can I just say some of you are just way too comfortable in your faith. For me, I can get way too comfortable in my faith. And one of the greatest blessings that I've ever experienced was in a season where I was just uncomfortable. A season where I was a little bit scared. Kelly and I had had Jacob, our son. Uh, he's got trisomy 8P, a, a chromosome disorder. And we sat down with the doctors after having Jake. And the doctor said, hey, if you do want to have more children, just want to need to, to let you know that you could have several miscarriages. You could have another child with severe special needs. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. That was scary. Kelly and I started talking and praying. And boy, a year and a half later, I thought, you know what? I don't, I don't want to live with regret because I didn't trust God. I, I didn't want to live the, the rest of my life saying, what if? God, what if we would have believed? What if we would have done something that, you know, that, that everybody else thought was crazy, but we believed that God could do something that we can't do ourselves? So we, we, we decided we'd try to get pregnant. A month later, Kelly got pregnant. And I got to tell you, for those nine months, I, I was scared. I was nervous. When Andrew was born, I broke down and cried like a baby but I got to experience something super powerful a blessing of a healthy son but in those moments I had to sacrifice my comfort I had to sacrifice my control but in the end God did something powerful and let me just say this we see this in these friends. We see a faith that's active, a faith that's persistent, a faith that's creative, a faith that's sacrificial, a church that embraces this kind of faith. Shelter Cove, if we embrace this kind of faith and say, God, God all of us, 
We, we, we want to reach our friends that way. We want to reach our community that way. We want to reach our world that way. We want to trust you in a way that's active, in a way that's persistent, where we don't give up on people, in a way that's creative, in a way that's sacrificial. We will be a force to be reckoned with. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of, a church that's persistent, where we, as followers of Christ, we don't give up on people because Jesus has never given up on us where we as a church think creatively. And we've got some people that do that. I was just talking to one of our, our guys on staff who did the video uh, that intros the message. He said, yeah, we just got done uh, taking care of our video that's in the Galaxy movie theaters right now. We, we've got an ad in the movie theaters. I'm like, man, that's awesome. People thinking outside the box. Uh, when Pokemon Go was going on, that huge video game, we had gyms here and people were coming to our church that had never been to church just to be a part of this video game. Uh, this last Friday night, we had over 100 high school students all over our church campus all night long. It was an all-nighter. Pray for Pastor Chad. He's tired, all right? <laughs> Doing things creatively. Why? We want to see people come to know Jesus. But it's interesting when we look at this passage, what did Jesus say? He said I, he saw their faith. It's the kind of faith that I want Jesus to see in all of our lives where he looks at us, he just kind of crosses his arms, and he smiles, and he says, that's a church that's active. That's a church that's persistent. That's a church that's creative. That's a church that's sacrificial. And because of that, God blesses us. He saw their faith. Point two in your notes. Point two in your notes. Jesus forgave his sins. Jesus forgave his sins. These guys lower their friend down on this mat right in front of Jesus. Now, I wonder how many of them, were, when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven to this man that's paralyzed. I wonder how many of them thought, really? Like, we were hoping that you would just heal him. Like, like, like what, Jesus, what's going on? Now, in that culture, we have to be in, uh, keep in mind that the mindset was, if, if you were, had some kind of a disease or a sickness, often it was tied to the sin in your life. That's just the understanding, the mindset. We, we know that part of it's, we just live in a world filled with sin. It's not directly because of our own sin, but because we live in a fallen world. In fact, Jesus put it this way in John chapter 9. John chapter 9, there was a man that was blind, and one of the disciples asked him, he said, Jesus, is this man blind because of his own sin or the sin of his parents? Jesus responds, and says, no, he's not blind because of his own sin or the sin of his parents. He's blind that the mighty work of God might be displayed in his life. And then Jesus, in a creative way, doesn't just reach out his hand and heal his blindness. He turns, he loogies in the ground, right? He spits, mixes his fingers with it, and he touches the man's eyes, and he is healed from his blindness. Again, another miracle of Jesus. So Jesus is having this conversation. The, the scribes are starting to wonder in their own minds, in their own eyes. They're starting to think, like, who is Jesus to say this, that he can forgive sins? Oh, only God can do that. Jesus, you're blaspheming. You're, you're claiming to do what only God can do. And this is what eventually got Jesus killed, is he kept on claiming to be God. Why? Because he was. He referred to himself in this passage as the Son of Man, fully God and fully man. Jesus did things that only God could do. Now, why would Jesus immediately say your sins are forgiven? Because the man's greatest need in his life was not a physical healing, but a spiritual healing. For so many of us, we can say, God, God, if you would just heal my hand or, or heal my cancer or heal this, God, my, my life would be great. No, we would still have sin in our life. And the Bible says that sin leads to death. The greatest healing that every single one of us need is our hearts. We need our sin to be forgiven. We need access to a holy God. And only through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection do we know that we have the forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternity with Jesus in heaven? 
So we see point two, that Jesus forgave his sins. Now, it's interesting to look at this paralyzed guy. This paralyzed guy has sin, what it, what, what, what it, or he's, he's paralyzed. He had sin in his life. It was forgiven. But it's a reminder to all of us that sin literally paralyzes us. And the miracles that Jesus did, whether it was the healing of the blind man, healing of the, the paralyzed, healing of the leprosy, it doesn't matter what kind of sin you have in your life, Jesus can heal you. And that's the first thing that Jesus did. He met his greatest need and forgave him of his sin. Notice what he does then, the third point in your notes. Jesus healed the man. Jesus healed the man. So not only did Jesus see their faith, not only did Jesus forgive this man's sin, but Jesus heals the man. Now, why would Jesus do that? Jesus asked the question, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or get up, take your mat, and go home? Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven, right? Because nobody would know if you actually did it. But to say that, take up your mat, get up, and go home, only God could do that. So Jesus in this moment is proving that he is God. And he tell, tells the paralyzed guy, get up, take your mat, go home. So what does the paralyzed guy have to do? He has to put his faith in God and say, God, okay, I'm trusting you. I mean, there's probably atrophy in his legs. His muscles hadn't been used for maybe months, maybe years, maybe since his birth. And he literally stands up, picks up his bed, and walks home. I would have been like, see you later, guys, right? <laughs> Jesus saw their faith. Jesus forgave his sin, and Jesus healed the man. Now, I want us to see two realities before we close our time. Two realities that, that we have to keep in mind. Number one is they deeply loved their friend. They deeply loved their friend. And this is a part that often we don't focus on. See, a lot of us will think, you know, what are the obstacles of my friends coming to know Jesus Christ? It's, it's how I feel. It's, I'm not comfortable. I'm waiting for the, the right time. Or we see other obstacles out there that, that we just identify. C can I just say this? Most likely, the greatest obstacles of our friends, our family members, our neighbors coming to Christ is not how we feel, is not what we see, but it's who we are. Can I be that blunt? We just don't love people the way we should. People look at us and they see hypocrites. They see hatred. They see a critical spirit, a judgmental spirit. What did these four friends have? They, they had an authentic love for their friend. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 22. He says, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I think the greatest issue is that we just don't love people with the love of Christ. Can, can I just get real personal for a moment? For so many of my years of my life, at least probably half of my life, I was more concerned spiritually on how I looked instead of how I loved. As long as I wasn't watching R-rated movies, as long as I wasn't using any profanity or bad language, as long as I was sexually pure, as long as I was fill in the blank, as long as I spiritually looked good and looked like I had my act together and looked religious, that was what mattered. And you know who that's like? It's like the Pharisees. That's like the hypocrites. And God began to change my heart and began to make me understand what, what the Christian life is all about. It's not about how spiritually we look. It's about how we love. Authentically loving others the way that Jesus Christ loves us. Because you know what Jesus is doing in the next passage uh, in Mark chapter 2? He's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. Like what, what would happen as a church if we weren't consumed with spiritually how we looked but how we loved? Here's what, here's what I believe would happen, is that there would be a radical change, not just in our church, but in our city. Because there would be some of you that would think, you know what, there's some prostitutes in our city that need the love of Christ. So that there would be a, a, a group of, of gals on a regular basis that would go out and show the love of Jesus to prostitutes. 
We wouldn't be concerned about how people per perceived us. We would be going and sitting down and having coffee with people that, that are gay, that are homosexual, because we wouldn't let that be a fear. We would love them with the love of Jesus Christ, not embracing their behavior, but telling them about the love and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We wouldn't be caught up in how we looked. We would be caught up in how we love. Sitting in the hot tub with a, a guy uh, this last week at In Shape after I worked out, he was in his 60s. We started talking about church because I kind of try to steer conversations in that direction. And uh, asked him about church. You go to church? He said, no. I said, why not? He said, my mother-in-law watches Christian television 24 hours a day. And I'm thinking, that's a long time. <laughs> and he said, she is the most hateful person I know. I'm like, thinking in my mind, you might be my brother-in-law because I think we have the same mother-in-law, right? <laughs> my mother-in-law is actually amazing. So, but I thought about saying it and I'm, I'm glad I didn't. You know why he wants nothing to do with church? Nothing to do with Jesus? His mother-in-law. Talked to another gal this last week at the gym and she has been hopping around it from church to church for 17 years because every church she goes to, she feels criticized, judged, and just condemned. These guys deeply loved their friends. They deeply loved them. We need to work on that. Second thing that we see is they deeply trusted Jesus. They deeply trusted Jesus. Jesus put it this way. In Matthew 17, he says, Truly I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, grain of a mustard seed is super small, you can barely see it. He says, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus is saying, if you've got just a little bit of faith, you can say to that mountain, move, and it's going to move. See, Jesus didn't talk about obstacles. He talked about faith. He talked about having more faith. And as we look at this story of this paralyzed guy on this mattress with the four friends and their willingness to do whatever is possible, it really reminds us of an event that many of us have been a part of. I mean, these guys were carrying this guy on the, the mat. They, they lowered him through the roof. His his sin was, was something that spiritually leads to death. He's forgiven and he's resurrected. It's, it's really the illustration of a funeral. I mean, these guys are like pallbearers, lowering their friend into the ground. And he's raised to new life. That's what every single one of us have the opportunity to do because your faith will impact others there's other people in your life that need to be carried to jesus and they need the resurrection power of jesus christ and today you may be here and thinking you know what god would you help me love others deeply and would you help me trust you deeply and then give me a faith that's going to impact others and yet maybe there's some of you here today that you understand you realize maybe more now than ever that your sin spiritually speaking paralyzes you and you need Jesus to look at you in the eyes and say, my brother, my sister, your sin is forgiven. Let's bow and let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for Jesus. That Jesus is the same, that Jesus hasn't changed God, that the, the opportunities that people had back then are the same opportunities that we have today. God, you are still all-powerful, and would you forgive us for the times where we don't believe that? God, forgive us for the times where we've given up on our friends, given up on our family members. God, thank you for never giving up on us. So God, today, would you renew our passion to see the lost come to Christ? And would you give us a faith where we can be part of that process? With all heads bowed, nobody looking around. Maybe you're here today and the person that you identify the most is, is the man on the mat. The man who's helpless. The man who needs forgiveness more than anything else. 
he needs God to do for him what only he can do. The same that you need today, you need God to do what only he can do, and that's give you new life in Jesus Christ. You can do that through a simple prayer. You can receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life with God. It's through a simple prayer. It's not the words of the prayer. It's the attitude of the heart. It's a prayer that goes something like this. Dear Jesus, would you come into my heart? Dear Jesus, I I repent of my sins and I give my life to you right now. Make me into the person that you want me to be. Change me from the inside out. I give you my heart. I give you total control of my life. Would you give me your forgiveness right now and make me new? If you prayed that prayer, I want to pray for you. Would you just stick up your hand in the air and look at me? If that's you today, you say, "I, I prayed that prayer, Pastor. Just wherever you're at, raise your hand and look at me. I see that hand. Good, who else? I see that hand. For the first time, you say, I I want Jesus Christ in my life. I need his forgiveness. I see that hand. Just raise your hand and look at me. If that's you today, you say, I need the healing power of Jesus. Good, I see that hand, sir. I see this hand. I see that hand. See that hand. See that hand. You're here today and you realize your greatest need is not physical, it's spiritual. One more chance. If you're here today and you say, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Just raise your hand wherever you're at and look at me. Good, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Good, good. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for the hands that were raised today. People in this room that walked over from death to life, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your freedom. Thank you for your healing. God, would you watch over them and protect them all the days of their life? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.